Hello, I'm Brian Atkinson and welcome once again to UK Aircraft Explored. In this in-depth video, we shall be covering the bombsite Mark 14 within the Avro Lancaster bomber. We shall also be covering the bombsite's installation within the Handley Page Halifax, Short Stirling and the Vickers Wellington bombers. As always, we shall be referring to wartime air ministry manuals. I hope you find this interesting. Experience had shown that two features in addition to accuracy are desirable in a general purpose bomb site. First, the site should not make it necessary for the aircraft to fly straight and level for more than the least possible length of time when approaching the target. Secondly, the number of settings and computations which must be made by the bomb aimer during flight should be reduced to a minimum so that all his attention can be given to releasing the bombs at the correct moment. The bomb site Mark 14, which became operational from 1942 onwards, satisfied both these requirements. When using the site, the bomb aimer sees a graticle in the form of a sword-shaped cross moving over the ground, and at the same time during a bombing attack, the point on the ground covered by the cross represents the point of impact of the bomb released at that instant. Avoiding action can be taken if required, almost up to the point of bomb release, while making a correctly banked turn or when flying inclined downwards or climbing. The simplicity of using the Mark 14 is shown by the fact that only five settings have to be made, and that all these settings can be made before flight, although wind speed and direction must be reset in the target area. The bomb aimer is free, therefore, to concentrate solely on identifying the target, directing the pilot and releasing the bombs. Any alterations in height, airspeed or course are automatically accounted for by the bomb site, and all the bomb aimer has to do is to direct the pilot so that the gratical passes over the target. We shall now go through a general overview of the system. The bomb site Mark 14 consists of two main components. A sighting head which is mounted in the nose of the aircraft in the position normally occupied by the bomb site and a rectangular box called the computer unit, which may be some distance away from the sighting head. The computer unit is the brains of the site and controls the position of the gratical on the ground through two flexible shafts which connect the computer to the sighting head. We'll now look at the sighting head. The bomb aimer looks at the ground through a piece of plain glass called the reflector. The gratical is projected onto the reflector by a collimator and the bomb aimer must move his head until his eye receives the reflected light. He then sees the gratical reflected from the glass and he also sees the ground through the glass so that it appears to him that the gratical is on the ground. The point on the ground covered by the gratical depends on the angle at which the collimator is set. The angle made by the collimator and a line perpendicular to the reflector is called the sighting angle. And this angle is the same as that between the line of sight and the perpendicular. The collimator is automatically set at the correct angle by one of the flexible shafts from the computer unit. The sighting angle, which is set at any instant, can be seen on a circular scale to the left of the sighting head reflector, and also on a dial which can be seen through a window at the bottom right hand corner of the computer. The long line of the gratical is the drift line, and if the correct settings are made on the computer, objects on the ground always appear to travel parallel to this line. 
The short line of the graticle is the release line. The bomb's being released by the bomb aimer when the target reaches this line. Any alteration in the drift angle due to a change of course is determined by the computer unit and is transmitted to the sighting head by one of the flexible shafts. The lower part of the sighting head is fixed and the upper part is rotated by the flexible shaft. The drift set at any instant can be read on a scale on the lower part of the sighting head. The drift line of the graticle is comparatively short and does not reach distant objects. To enable the bomb aimer to see if the aircraft will track over a distant object, a handle is secured to the arm supporting the collimator, and by moving this handle forward, the collimator can be rotated so that the graticle moves forward over the ground, irrespective of the sighting angle setting. In effect, therefore, the handle enables the drift line to be extended to pick up a distant object. When the collimator handle is moved in this way, the cross line of the graticle does not indicate the release point. When the handle is released, the collimator returns to the sighting angle determined by the computer, and the cross line again indicates the release point. If the collimator handle is moved forward, the line of sight describes a plane, as shown here. The fact that avoiding action can be taken when using the sight is largely due to the sighting plane is stabilised in roll, that is, the sighting plane remains vertical when the aircraft banks. If the sighting plane was not stabilised, the bomb aimer would see the graticle move a long way to the right, as shown dotted in this diagram. Because the sighting plane is stabilised, a turn made shortly before release to bring the graticle onto the target does not cause the graticle to move away from the target, and it continues to indicate the point of impact of the bomb. If a bomb is released when the aircraft is turning, it moves along a tangent to the path of the aeroplane, and this tangent lies in the sighting plane, as shown in this diagram. The sighting plane is stabilised by movement of the reflector. A head-on view of the sight when the aeroplane is flying level is shown at A. The reflector is horizontal, and therefore the sighting plane is vertical. If the aeroplane banks as shown at B, the collimator moves with it. The reflector, however, is linked to a gyro in such a way that it only rotates through half the angle through which the aeroplane banks. As the light from the reflector to the eye makes the same angle with a line perpendicular to the reflector as that made by the light from the collimator, the sighting plane remains vertical. Thus, if the bank is 40 degrees, the reflector turns through 20 degrees. The bubble level on the sighting head is covered as it is only used when the bomb sight is levelled after installation. The bomb aimer does not need to see it when using the sight. When the sighting head is not in use, a protective cover is rotated so that it covers the reflector. The cover serves as a protection for the reflector and holds the collimator out of the way, as shown here. We'll now look at the switch box. Electric current for the gratical lamp and for a lamp which illuminates the drift scale is brought from the switch box. The supply enters the box through a two pin plug and socket in the bottom left hand corner and the two leads going to the lamps leaves from a four pin plug which is pulled when removing the sighting head from the aircraft. The drift scale lamp is controlled by a dimmer switch in the top left hand corner and the gratical lamp is controlled by a rheostat and tumbler switch on the right hand side. 
The sighting head is secured to the spigot of the mounting bracket by a locking catch which must be pressed down when removing the sighting head. The adjustable screw and a scale on the mounting bracket are used when levelling the sight. We'll now look at the computer unit. The computer unit is a mechanical analog measuring computer and has no memory. The setting knobs and dials on the computer can be seen here. Five settings must be made and from these settings and the measurements which it makes automatically the computer calculates the sighting angle and drift angle. The sighting angle is shown near the bottom right hand corner of the computer. The settings which must be made are as follows. Wind direction over the target area. Wind speed over the target area. The altitude of the target above sea level. the bomb's TV or terminal velocity and levelling. The terminal velocity of all bombs to be dropped should be recorded on the levelling card on the top right hand corner of the computer. If meteorological wind information is used all the settings could be made before takeoff but wind speed and direction must be reset during flight as more accurate information becomes available via the navigator's estimates and communications with Pathfinder aircraft over the target. In most types of bomber aircraft, course is fed into the computer by connection to the DR compass and is shown on a dial. The course dial on the computer can be matched with the DR Compass Master Unit by pressing in and turning a synchronised knob shown at the top of the right hand end of the computer. A dimmer switch in the top right hand corner controls the lamps which illuminate the dials. The scale and a red line called the glide datum line seen through a window near the bottom left hand corner are used when levelling the computer. The functioning of the computer can be seen in this diagram. Starting in the top left hand corner, the course fed into the computer is combined with the wind setting and the airspeed, which is automatically measured to give the ground speed and drift angle. Drift angle is transmitted to the sighting head by one of the flexible shafts. Height, as measured by the computer, is combined with the target height setting to give the height above the target. From the height above the target and the ground speed already found is calculated the ideal bombing angle. This is corrected for trail, obtained from a combination of airspeed and the bomb terminal velocity setting for glide or climb measured automatically and for the levelling scale setting to give the sighting angle which is transmitted to the sighting head. It should be emphasised that the bomb aimer could use the Mark 14 sight effectively without knowing anything about the internal construction of the sight or how it functions. However, here's an overview of how the computer unit worked. The computer unit is a mechanical analogue measuring computer. Apart from a 24 volt supply that runs the gyros and compressor pumps, the computer is entirely mechanical. As you can see, the computer is a clever system comprised of drive shafts, cogs, reduction gears, cams, worm drives and flexible cables. 
the computer can be divided for the purpose of this overview into two parts, one part which measures and the other which calculates. Height, airspeed and glide are measured and from these measurements and the data which is set by the bomb aimer, the computer calculates the sighting angle and drift angle. The power to work the calculating mechanism is provided by two electric motors which rotate continuously when the computer is switched on. Each motor forms part of two servo systems so that four servos are used altogether. One motor provides the power to feed the height and airspeed measurements into the calculating mechanism and the other motor provides the power to transmit the sighting angle and drift angle to the sighting head. In order to provide a focused look at the various mechanisms that make up the Mark 14 computer unit, here is a series of diagrams and photographs that cover each mechanism. The height mechanism is shown here in red. The airspeed mechanism is shown in green. The wind mechanism is illustrated in pink. The drift mechanism is outlined in orange. The ground speed mechanism can be seen here in dark blue. And the sighting angle mechanism is shown in light blue. The sighting angle mechanism calculates the ideal bombing angle from the ground speed and the height above the target. A servo system is used to provide the power to transmit this angle to the sighting head and the mechanism of the servo is such that it corrects the angle for glide and for the terminal velocity of the bomb. Here's a diagram showing the ideal bombing angle in level flight. If an ideal bomb is released from an aircraft flying at a height h, it will follow a path such as that shown in this diagram. If there is no wind and the airspeed is v, the bomb continues to move forward with this speed while it is falling. The terminal velocity mechanism is marked here in yellow. The TV mechanism is connected both to the airspeed mechanism and to the sighting angle mechanism. The correction which must be made to the sighting angle for the ballistics of the bomb depends partly upon the airspeed and the correction it made through the sighting angle mechanism. The components of the computer unit are mounted on both sides of the base plate. A sheet metal flange is secured on each side of the base plate and the front and rear covers are attached to these flanges. The switch, six pin plug and connections for the pitot, static, air supply and exhaust are mounted on the right hand end of the rear flange. The covers are made more or less airtight by fibre strips which are stuck to the covers where they come into contact with the flanges. The pitch gyro projects through the back cover and is sealed with a rubber ring. The computer is supported on four anti-vibration mountings fixed to a mounting frame which is secured to the structure of the aircraft. The computer is never removed from the frame as the anti-vibration mountings protect the instrument against shock. The frame is connected to the case of the computer by two earthing bombs. The mounting frame is not used in certain aircraft, such as the Mosquito, owing to the limited amount of space available. The sea level pressure setting knob and the pointer secured to it are mounted on the front cover and are not connected to the mechanism of the computer. 
The remaining four control knobs are identical, except that two used to set wind have a blue circle painted on each, and the TV and height knobs have green circles on them. The height and airspeed mechanisms together form a complete unit, which is usually called the Altas unit. The components of the unit are mounted on one base plate, so that the complete Altas unit can be readily detached from the main base plate. Each pair of bellows are mounted on a bracket which is secured to the base plate by a single screw. The way in which the bellows and the bracket are supported can be seen in this diagram. We shall now look at the bombsite Mark 14's installation in various bombers, starting with the Lancaster. Here's the bombsite's installation. A diagrammatic installation. Connections to the sighting head. And a view of the front of the computer. Services to the computer unit. We will now look at the Handy Page Halifax installation. Here's the bomb sites installation and a diagrammatic installation. The connections to the sighting head and services to the computer unit. and a view of the front of the computer. And now for a look at the short sterning installation. Here's the bomb sites installation. And here's a diagrammatic installation. And here's the sterling's computer and sighting head arrangement. And finally, we shall look at the Mark 14's installation within the Vickers Wellington. Here's the Wimpy's bomb sites installation. And here a diagrammatic of the installation. This is the sighting head and switch box. And here's the bomb site cock. And here's the Wellington's mounting for the computer unit. The Mark 14 bomb site was fitted to many other wartime aircraft, and the Americans fitted the site in their aircraft, designating it the T1. The Mark 14 bomb site's amazing design improved bombing accuracy from two miles around the target at the start of the war to 150 yards by 1945. Well that's it for this video, I hope you found it interesting. If you like what I do on this channel, please click the like button and please subscribe. And also click the bell. Remember it's free and you'll receive notifications when my future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.